Hello and welcome to the 10th session in our webinar series with the Alliance for Water Efficiency. WaterSense and AWE started the series in 2015. The goal was to reach the different audiences that have a role in ensuring outdoor water efficiency, including landscape professionals, local governments, and water utilities. We have had nine successful webinars to date, many of which highlighted how local governments and the outdoor industry are working together to reach consumers. All of our webinars have been recorded and are available for on-demand viewing for people who are busy during the day when we hold the live session. Let's cover a few housekeeping topics before we get started. All attendees are muted when they enter the webinar to minimize background noise. To ask questions, you can type those in the chat box at the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and we will answer those questions at the end of the webinar. This presentation will be available on the WaterSense website and AWE's YouTube channel following the presentation. We'd also like to start out with a few polls. Who do we have on the call today? So it looks like 34% of you are with a water utility, and then 28% are irrigation professionals, followed by about 22% local and state government. For our next poll question, what part of the country are you calling from? So it looks like most of you are calling from the west, followed by the southwest, and we have some representation in the southeast as well. Thanks so much for your answers. Today's webinar, as you know, is working with homeowners associations to budget water. Our featured speakers are Julius Duncan, Outdoor Coordinator for WaterSense. Julius is an Environmental Engineer for WaterSense Outdoor Programs. He has a master's in agricultural engineering from the University of Georgia and a bachelor's degree from Florida A&M University. Marianne Dickinson is the president and CEO of the Alliance for Water Efficiency and the executive director of the California Water Efficiency Partnership. She has over 40 years of experience, having worked at the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority, and the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. She is a graduate of the University of Connecticut with a degree in environmental planning. Marianne has authored numerous publications on water conservation, land use planning, and natural resources management, and has co-produced two films which have aired on public television and community cable stations. Our last speaker, Jeff Lee, is a water co conservation coordinator for the city of Gilbert, Arizona. He has 10 years of experience in the landscaping contracting field in Arizona, and has worked for three years at major irrigation as a major irrigation manufacturer in the technical support division, assisting end users, contractors, and distributors in troubleshooting products. Jeff was also certified in golf division software and hardware to support those customers as well. In 1998, Jeff took a position at the City of Mesa Water Conservation, assisting internal and external customers save water. In 2006, Jeff moved to the town of Gilbert Water Conservation Office. Before we hear from Marianne and Jeff, Julius will discuss outdoor water use and water smart landscapes, review the WaterSense water budget tool, and provide an update on the WaterSense spray sprinkler body specification. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Julius. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll go over the WaterSense water budget tool, how it can be used on residential and commercial landscapes, and resources WaterSense has developed that can help in decisions for water efficient landscapes. The WaterSense water budget tool was designed to support our new home specification, where landscapes need to meet the requirements of the tool to ensure that the home has an efficient landscape design. 
but you can also use it to consider how design will affect your water needs. It's an easy online tool. Although landscape planning with a water budget might be a little daunting, I think you'll find the tool is pretty simple to use. The water budget tool can be used to ensure a measure of efficiency and regional suitability by suggesting an appropriate amount of water to apply to a landscape based on local climate data. It can also help you comply with the WaterSense new home specification. It takes into account plant type, plant water needs, irrigation system design, and applied water that the landscape receives by irrigation or precipitation. Let's look at a sample residential landscape. In this example, we have a house with a paved driveway, majority turf grass, and several areas with trees. In the first step of the tool, you will input the property area, not including the hardscapes or the house. Input your zip code so that the tool can calculate regional rainfall and evapotranspiration. In the water budget tool, we can input the data for the area of high water use turf grass and fixed spray sprinklers, medium water use trees with micro spray irrigation, and high water use shrubs, also with micro spray irrigation. Based on this setup, the water budget tool tells us we should budget for 82,000 gallons of water per month, but we're actually using nearly 100,000 gallons, which is 17,000 more, indicating this landscape uses more irrigation than allotted as determined by the tool. Let's change a few things by decreasing the area with turf, increasing the number of shrubs around the perimeter with drip irrigation, adding trees with drip irrigation, and incorporating a vegetable garden. Now, as you see, we've achieved a monthly water use lower than what the water budget has allotted. The water budget tool is a great way to view the impact of different plants and irrigation configurations on water use. Water smart landscape concepts can be incorporated to help reduce irrigation in the water budget tool. This will create an attractive landscapes that use designs and plants that are well suited to local conditions. WaterSmart Design uses a few basic concepts to help you create an attractive, healthy landscape. Native and low water using plants require little water beyond normal rainfall. Grouping vegetation based on watering needs in the hydrozones allows you to water each zone specific needs. Plant turf grass in areas that are most practical and look for low water use turfs. Permeable sidewalks and driveways can also be used to replace hardscapes. WaterSense's commercial and institutional best management practice guidebook, WaterSense at Work, was developed to help commercial and institutional facilities understand, manage, and reduce water use. The guidebook includes case studies demonstrating how facilities have successfully implemented water efficiency best practices, including outdoor water improvements. We encourage you to take a look at our WaterSense website if you are seeking additional information on water efficiency. To further reduce outdoor water waste and improve the performance of in-ground irrigation systems nationwide, EPA is adding spray sprinkler bodies to its suite of WaterSense labeled products. The sprinkler body is the exterior shell that connects to the irrigation system piping and houses the spray nozzle that applies water on the landscape. System pressure higher than what is recommended for the sprinkler nozzle can lead to excessive flow rates, misting, fogging, and uneven coverage. These products can maintain and provide a constant flow at the nozzle across a range of inlet pressures, reducing excessive flows and water waste that would otherwise occur at high pressures. Installing WaterSense labeled spray sprinkler bodies can save the average household 5,600 gallons of water and $60 per year in water and sewage cost. Consider replacing your existing timer-based controllers with WaterSense labeled weather-based irrigation controllers. These controllers act like a thermostat, using local weather and landscape conditions to tailor watering schedules for actual site conditions. In all, we have more than 215 models of controllers by more than 20 manufacturers that have earned the label, and we expect the list will continue to grow. Replacing a standard clock timer with a properly set WaterSense labeled irrigation controller can save water and money, saving the average home 8,800 gallons of water a year. WaterSense is developing a specification for soil moisture-based controllers, and if all goes smoothly, these products should be eligible for the label later in 2018. As I mentioned, WaterSense has published a specification for spray sprinkler bodies with integral pressure regulation. And micro-irrigation has a versatile design that can be used to irrigate plants, shrubs, and trees. The benefit of micro-irrigation is the ability to deliver water directly to the root zone of plants where it can be applied more efficiently without loss due to runoff and overspray. 
You can find WaterSense labeled products across the country at national, regional, and local in industry distributors, at home improvement stores, and online. Look for the WaterSense label on product packaging and online, or use the WaterSense product search tool on our website to find a complete list of products that have earned the WaterSense label. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Marianne Dickinson with AWE. A special thanks to AWE for their partnership in presenting the WaterSmart Innovations Conference last week. WSI features more than 100 professional sessions, an expo hall showcasing water efficient products and services, and tours to venues illustrating Southern Nevada's commitment to water efficiency. We also want to congratulate AWE for winning a 2017 Excellence in Strategic Collaboration Award. In addition to AWE's continued partnership in presenting webinars like the one you're attending today, we wanted to highlight their other strategic collaboration efforts in 2017. AWE worked with WaterSense and other partners to provide research and tools that highlight the importance of the WaterSense program and water efficiency. They also collaborated with Plumbing Manufacturers International to conduct a study that determined replacing older toilets with high efficiency models in Arizona, California, Colorado, Georgia, and Texas could save about 170 billion potable gallons of water per year. A full list of WaterSense Sustained Excellence, Partners of the Year, and Excellence Award winners is available on the WaterSense website. Now I pass it to Marianne. Thank you. Hi, Marianne, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? We have you now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you, uh, EPA. I really, we really appreciated AWE, the partnership that we have with you. And um, this webinar series is one example of that partnership that we have had for a number of years. Um, we're really pleased to be here today. Uh, what we like to do in the time that we have is talk to you about a national outdoor water conservation survey that we are in the process of conducting. We want to give you a little bit of a show, a peek at uh, what we're creating. So why don't we launch into the next slide uh, and I'll explain to you what we are attempting to do with this conservation survey. We know that many water utilities and water supply providers out there have been conducting over the years uh, outdoor water conservation programs. Um, and just about every utility um, that we have been surveying uh, that has customer in-ground irrigation systems has some way to help their customers manage those systems. So the Alliance for Water Efficiency and the California Water Efficiency Partnership have been surveying uh, what states uh, have these existing outdoor water conservation programs. And these programs include uh, ordinances, uh, restrictions, and rebates and incentives, you know, the wide suite of programs that are available and we wanted to assemble for your use all of these findings in a matrix an Excel based matrix that we would be a live document that we could add to that you could have reference access to and that has links that you can uh, use to get more information about the programs so what we want to do today is give you a sneak preview of what this uh, looks like so in the next slide, uh, you'll see that we have begun to survey um, utility programs all across the United States. We actually started first in all of the states except California because we, um, we were giving a presentation earlier this year about what the other 49 states are doing when we were in California. And then we suddenly thought, well, gosh, it, it makes sense to actually have all 50 states included. And um, to the extent that Canadian provinces would like to be added to this as well, we would uh, welcome their participation for an overall North American uh, outdoor water conservation program survey. But you can see how the regions break out so far. Um, this is just based on the preliminary results that we have undertaken. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see uh, that we have actually featured the California ones more specifically. Uh, we have inventoried uh, information for six communities in uh, California uh, with another uh, five or so that are underway where the information is still being assembled. So what we're giving you here is a sneak preview on what it looks like so that we can recruit your help in um, getting more of this completed. So the next slide 
actually shows you what the matrix itself looks like. Uh, the regions on the left, then the state, then the city within that state, uh, what type of customer is be being um, covered by the incentives or the ordinance and restrictions. And then you'll see the categories uh, up across the top in the columns, uh, the various categories of ordinances and restrictions, incentives and rebates, and services. So this is essentially what it looks like. The X is with the underlying um, you know, underlined X in the box shows that that's one that has a live link that you can click into and get specific information about what that particular item is. So the next slide, uh, we'll start talking about what some of those typical ordinance elements are. And I'm going to race through this pretty fast, but the presentation itself will be separately posted on our AWE website, so you can actually get the PowerPoint uh, presentation there um, if I'm going too fast uh, for you to follow. Uh, the recording also will be available if you want to listen to it as well. So the ordinance elements fall into a number of categories. Uh, the first is the most obvious one, emergency water use during droughts, so water use restrictions, penalties, uh, variances, all of that that it typically goes with drought uh, irrigation ordinances uh, for emergency water use. Uh, but then separately from the emergency use, there's drought response itself, uh, definition of drought stages, what the restrictions are within the stages, and that includes even total outdoor watering bans when the stage gets severe. A third area is water-wise landscaping and irrigation efficiency, um, which is, these are ordinances that indicate limits on possible areas for turf, uh, give guidelines for planting, uh, irrigation designs per hydrozone, maybe requirements for smart controllers or guidelines on smart controllers, uh, anything that falls into that kind of water sense, water-wise landscaping category. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see we also, uh, in the ordinance elements, we talk about irrigation schedules, um, off-peak outdoor watering, whether it's year-round or whether it's just seasonal, uh, 48 hours post-rain event. Um, these are the types of things that are inventoried in the survey that we're conducting. Um, many of the examples include water waste ordinances. That's a fairly typical element in this package of outdoor programs, and that includes uh, irrigation overspray restrictions, uh, prohibitions on washing hardscapes, uh, you know, pool cover uh, restrictions or requirements for use, uh, water feature uh, recirculation requirements, automatic shutoff hosel nozzles for hoses, uh, etc. Um, and then there's a whole section on uh, water budgets for large landscapes, commercial facilities, and golf courses. And to the extent that there are water budgets for residential customers, uh, they're included as well. So in the next slide, we talk about uh, what some of our observations are um, for other types of ordinance elements. Um, gray water is sometimes listed as an element in an ordinance, um, so it provides uh, guidance on residential permits uh, for uh, you know, residential gray water use, commercial gray water use, um, generally prohibiting overhead spray. So where there are gray water um, elements in the ordinance, we flag that in the matrix. Um, also rainwater harvesting, and um, we have some examples of those, and where there are soil amendments that are in the ordinance, um, uh, you know, listings, and we uh, flag those too, like compost amendments that are required in new and residential, residential and commercial uh, developments like uh, Denver is doing. Um, so what are some of our observations? The next slide actually lists some of those, and um, those, uh, next slide please. Um, some of those observations are that uh, turf area limitations and approval of irrigation designs are, are pretty typical revisions to municipal codes. Um, we are seeing that in a number of places. Um, we also see restrictions on irrigation times. That's present in just about every region we've surveyed. Uh, gray water ordinances, as we've discussed a minute ago, are not as prevalent. Uh, there are some state guidelines. Uh, Colorado, for example, has Regulation 86, so there are communities in Colorado looking at it as well. Um, and then the whole category of water budgets, uh, it's especially prevalent in, in California and Colorado as well as in uh, Las Vegas. So uh, water budgets has it affects uh, irrigation quantity and timing is, uh, is one of the elements that we're, we're inventorying. 
And then we have also noticed that with the exception of Portland and Seattle, uh, all of the cities and towns that we're looking at have at least one water conservation ordinance or restriction that impacts outdoor use. So it is, it is rapidly becoming identified in the utility community that uh, if, you're, if you care about water efficient use and if you care about reducing demand, you have to be doing something in the outdoor sector. This is not an area we can ignore anymore. Uh, next slide. So in this next area, we want to talk about incentives and rebates. And um, we are taking a look at where communities are offering uh, rebates and uh, financial reasons for customers to participate. And we see quite a few of that. There are only four cities so far that we have found that don't offer incentives or rebates. And they're listed here, Phoenix, Arizona, Medford, Oregon, Oklahoma City, and, and Oklahoma, and Cary, North Carolina. Um, and so they have programs, of course, that, that consist of public education and, and you know, self-initiated landscape improvements, but they don't actually offer incentives at this point uh, to customers. But most of the programs seem to do that. And rebates for smart irrigation controllers appear to be the most common incentive uh, for uh, just about all customer classes. Um, and most of those rebates, uh, WaterSense will be pleased to know, require WaterSense certification. So we are uh, beginning to incentivize two direct water sense uh, product replacement. Um, turf removal rebates are pretty local to just the west and southwest. We don't typically see those in a lot of other areas. Um, uh, California is, when we finish this survey, you will all see that California has probably the most wide and comprehensive spread of incentive and rebate programs simply because of the, the, the recent five-year drought has created a huge amount of, of program development there. Um, but we're also seeing, in addition to the typical types of landscape programs, that, that rain barrel and cistern rebates are starting to become more popular and are offered by uh, a number of cities across the United States. So next slide. Just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the observations um, that we have for services. Um, we are seeing that on-site audits for our all types of customers are the most common conservation service uh, that's among the surveyed cities. So we're all doing audits, we're all going out there and talking to our customers about how they can reduce their water use. And these audits typically include uh, system improvement recommendations and scheduling. Um, five of the sample cities that we've looked at so far offer customer water budgets, and you see the list of those uh, cities there. Uh, but just about everybody is providing educational information and outdoor water conservation in the form of classes, print materials, video resources, or all of the above. Um, the classes uh, often focus on sustainable landscape design, which we're increasingly seeing more promotion of, um, and, and efficient irrigation design in particular. Um, so the, besides the, the standard services that we're looking at for the matrix, uh, we know that a number of you out there are offering very unique uh, conservation services. So one example is Tampa, who provides up to 10 different irrigation flags to assist with system repairs. So that's a, an innovative strategy that we, we hadn't seen in other places. Uh, so next slide. So I just want to finish off by talking about the whole watershed approach to sustainable landscaping. We're, we're seeing that take a great effect in California, um, and we are probably looking to see that replicate throughout the country. It's not just about reducing outdoor irrigation. It's about capturing storage, storing and reusing the water that's already on site. Um, using stormwater runoff reductions to help with landscaping, reduce pesticide use, reduce green waste, reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, generate habitat and food for insects and wildlife. In, in short, just a holistic approach to how, the role that landscape plays on the property. So in the next slide, um, we talk about where this has been uh, incorporated around the country and what types of ways. So you see some cities listed here, the types of programs that they are offering on the left and the details about the programs on the right. Um, in the interest of time, I won't read that, but that will be available to you following the webinar. You can take a look. And you can also take a look directly at the matrix itself that lists those programs. The next slide lists where those watershed approaches are, are, are really being implemented in California too. So you'll see there are some examples there, but as we populate the California examples in the matrix, there will be a, a, a number of these in addition that um, we will be adding as, as time goes on. 
So moving to the next slide. Uh, just to conclude, um, we know that the, the matrix itself isn't fully complete yet. Um, we want all of you to take a look at the examples we've provided that are not just in your own climate and geography, but in places that where you know that, that there are similar challenges and customer bases. We're hoping uh, to make this water conservation, outdoor water conservation survey matrix a tool for planning your programs as well as for analyzing uh, how other programs might be uh, effective and might be ways to compare with yours. Um, the lessons we're learning here in this whole exercise is that uh, programs and ordinances are very different. They're, they're very tailor-made to the communities they serve, and they're impactful only when they're so tailored. Um, so we're not suggesting a cookie-cutter approach here that you just take one city's approach and just uh, overlay it on your own community. We're suggesting you take a look at where those specific elements would, would work for your situation. So here's the link to where you can find that uh, outdoor program matrix. And um, we will also, uh, again, perhaps when we send out the follow-up email after this webinar, we can send you the link directly so you can just click on it. But it's it's basically uh, on our allianceforwaterefficiency.org website. You can also go to the landscape sections of our resource library and you can find the outdoor uh, program matrix there. So I think the last slide is just uh, my contact information slide. I want to thank WaterSense for letting me uh, take some time in this webinar. I know we're talking and focusing on homeowner associations today with uh, um, you know, the presentation from Gilbert. Uh, and homeowner association uh, programs are ones that we will also be including in this matrix. So we wanted to give you an opportunity to hear about the work we're doing and to participate and share with us what you know about the programs in your community so that uh, we can make this matrix survey very complete. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Jeff Lee. I'm with the Town of Gilbert Water Conservation Office. I'm a water conservation specialist. And today we're going to talk about our uh, program that we uh, create water budgets for for our HOA landscapes. And it's certainly not a new idea, but we did want to share uh, how we kind of put our program together and some of the successes we've had. Uh, for those of you that are other uh, municipal utilities that are looking to put together such a program, um, you can learn from our uh, successes and also some of our mistakes. Uh, next slide. Uh, in Gilbert, we are predominantly a residential community looking at our 2016 water use. About 70% of our uh, water use is actually in the single family residential sector. Uh, but our commercial sector has been growing over the last 15 years. It's actually doubled. Uh, about 15 years ago, that was only about 10 or 11% of our total water use. Uh, so that is something we do want to focus on. Uh, but when we look at the actual uh, commercial water use, we want to look at it more in depth and see where that water is being used, uh, which is on the next slide. And we see that 70% of our commercial water customers are actually dedicated landscape meters. And that makes a lot of sense for us here in the desert southwest where irrigation is so prevalent. So we really want to focus on that. And we know there is a pretty good potential for savings in many, many cases in the uh, landscaping uh, area as far as efficient irrigation and good water management practices. So the way we kind of put the program together in the next slide is we wanted to look around and we started this in 2009 and we wanted to look at the HOAs we had and at that time we had 104 of them and we wanted to focus on the ones that had more than one acre of turf and the ones that were using potable water. Uh, at the time, those were the areas that we were focusing on. We do have some small custom home HOAs where they may only have about 15,000 square feet of landscape on the road frontage and everything inside is the actual single family residential uh, landscape and irrigation. Um, so we measured the turf on all of these uh, communities uh, using our aerial photos and we really can't uh, measure the DG all that accurately, or at least I should say easily would be a better uh, way to describe that, uh, because the turf in most HOAs are large contiguous pieces, and your decomposed granite where the plants are, are all these uh, tiny little areas, and sometimes you're not sure if it's part of the common area landscape 
or the residential landscape. Uh, so we would basically just zoom out on the aerial and uh, give our best wild guess at it uh, as best we could and kind of give that a percentage and apply that. That allowed us to look at overall how much water all of these communities should be using on their landscape by creating this water budget. And the way the water budget is created is very simple. It's shown in the next slide. It's science, but it's not rocket science. Basically, we know how many inches by uh, evapotranspiration these different plant materials need on each given month, uh, whether it's a turf grass or it's a desert planted area. Once we have the square footage, we now have all three dimensions. So we have a volume and we can just create that to gallons, uh, simple 7.48 uh, gallons per cubic foot. So that's really all that's going on here. So we created this uh, calculator, it's sim a simple uh, Excel spreadsheet, which we see in the next slide. And it looks really, really scary to people who don't know about evapotranspiration and all this stuff because it's just all these crazy numbers. But really what we did is we made it so simple is all you're really doing is uh, punching in the square footage for the turf areas and then the desert landscape areas. And one thing we did uh, realize early on is with the decomposed granite areas, not 100% of that area is actually covered in plants. And there's certainly no way we're going to measure individual plant canopies. Uh, maybe in the future our software will get better at uh, identifying it through infrared technology. Uh, it's not there yet, but it is getting there. So we would just apply a density factor to modify that square footage. And that allows us to show the customer uh, how many gallons per month the turf area should use, how many gallons per month the desert landscape areas should use, and of course totaling those together. And water conservation is important. All of our customers do recognize that uh, water is a valuable resource here in the West. Uh, but when you're talking to businesses, you can't forget to talk about the dollar component. So we build in our water rate structure there to show them how much uh, money they should be spending. Now, this is all based on historical weather, and there's no such thing as 100% irrigation efficiency. So we do increase the reference ET and the crop coefficients above and beyond what they actually are in order to account for reasonable system efficiency. So we'll tell our customers that if they have a system efficiency that's operating within reasonable standards as far as uniformity, they can water close to these water budgets and still have a healthy and attractive landscape. Our goal is not to have these people underwater landscapes. That's not the goal of water conservation. As Marianne pointed out, that is emergency response when you have a water supply shortage. So because the ET does fluctuate from year to year and there are other anomalies that happen out there, we're talking about landscapes in the real world, uh, not just computer modeling. Uh, we tell our customers that if they're within 20% of these calculated water needs, they're doing a good job of water management. Uh, if they're within 10% of these calculated water needs, we would consider that to be exceptional water management. Next slide. So when we looked at the HOAs, uh, those original ones we measured, we had about 456 acres of turf and about 700 acres of uh, decomposed granite planted areas. And we calculated out about uh, a little over seven, almost uh, 701 million gallons were actually needed for those areas, plus or minus at 20%. And we looked at the actual water use for those communities and we saw they were almost at 1.1 billion gallons worth of water use. So we're looking at a potential savings just out of those uh, 104 communities of about 381 million gallons. Um, so that's a pretty significant amount of water. So obviously we do want to contact these customers. We do want to offer them assistance. This is a voluntary program. So we, we uh, ask them to join and if they say no, we don't force them to. Um, but we wanted to just uh, target our uh, efforts as best we could. So really what we did then is we looked at the data a little bit more granularly and you can see that on the next slide. So we could see who we really wanted to talk to and basically I put these in the categories of the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we saw out of those communities, 22 of them were actually doing a very good job with their water management, so we don't want to specifically target them. If they'd like to join our program, we welcome them in, and that's all well and good, but really we want to talk to those people in those other two categories, where you can see in the ugly category, out of 33 communities, right there was about 204 million gallons worth of potential savings out of that 380 some that was out there. So those are the ones that we, we really wanted to target. So when we w started launching this program and uh, trying to do our outreach on our next slide here, uh, 
we did uh, put the information on our website and uh, we do uh, high consumption notifications. So if somebody's water use doubles or more from one month to the next, they do get a notification letter from the uh, Water Conservation Office. We do that for both our residential and our commercial customers. So within that high consumption notification, we would alert them to the uh, availability of our water budget program. Uh, there was a group in the area that uh, was specific to community managers uh, that, with the different property management companies. So we reached out to them and spoke at some of their events. Uh, the Arizona Republic is a valley-wide newspaper, so they actually came out and did an article on our program when we were still pretty early in its inception. And the great thing about uh, community managers and landscape contractors is there is a great deal of word of mouth. Um, especially with the community managers. It's pretty much everybody knows who most everybody else is. And when they get uh, really successful results out of some sort of a program, um, they're quite willing to share it. So we actually got a lot of our uh, enrolled uh, customers through word of mouth. Next slide. So one of the things we did is we did offer two classes to explain how these water budgets were created. Uh, we had 11 attendees at those classes. And while that sounds terrible, if you've got a few uh, community managers in there that uh, manage multiple communities within your service territory, each one of those may have uh, communities that add up to a total of 30 or more acres of turf and who knows how many more acres of uh, planted areas. So while there's not a great amount of people there, there's a great amount of square footage. So we invited property managers, uh, any HOA board members, and of course the landscape contractors, we invited them to come learn about the program as well. Next. So what we do is we arrange a meeting to review the water budgets, explain how they're created, how they can be helpful, and how they need to be interpreted. That is the important part. Uh, we'll identify any potential for savings. There's been uh, many instances where a community wants to enroll in the program uh, thinking that they're going to have all this tremendous water savings. Uh, but when we sit down with them and review their water use compared to their calculated water needs, we can say, unfortunately, you don't have any uh, potential for saving any money here. But the good news is, is your landscape contractor is doing a very good job of managing the water, which is a great thing for the contractor because it validates his attention to water management. Uh, it doesn't come easy and it doesn't come free. It takes time for the contractor to make the these things happen. Uh, if there is a potential for savings, we're going to identify some challenges. Uh, aging irrigation systems that have been maintained by multiple contractors throughout the years uh, all have the very common problems that we all see out there, mismatched heads, incorrect nozzles, uh, uh, pressure issues, pipe sizing issues, things like that. So uh, we help the com uh, contractor communicate with his customer about these issues and say, these are things you need to resolve so you can water down to these levels and still have an attractive landscape. Uh, we do require at the very least the community manager and the landscape contractor is there. Uh, we encourage uh, board members to be present as well because they are in effect the actual owners of the community. Um, but at the very minimum, the community manager and the landscape contractor has to be there. And the reason why we need them all there or require them to all be there is they all need to hear the same information from the same person, especially when it comes to interpret, interpreting these uh, water use calculations as far as what they can do and what they can't do. We also want to make sure if there is a potential for savings that this does not become a club to beat up the landscape contractor with. Uh, that is not the purpose of this tool. This tool is a communication piece. So now the contractor and their customer now have the ability to discuss water management on a reasonable level. Um, so we want to make sure that the people understand that this is not a club to beat up their contractor with. And we also make sure that they understand that uh, the landscape contractors are not the problem. They're actually the solution. They're the ones that can make the water management happen. Um, so if there is a potential for savings and that introduces some ire on the part of the uh, board members or community manager, uh, we simply ask them, have you ever told them that they need to manage the water to this level? And the answer is always no. Basically what they've always told the contractor is to keep it green. So if that's the only uh, direction you're giving your contractors, um, that's the kind of water use you can expect to see. Next slide. 
uh, we do monthly updates. Early on in the program, we would sit down with them, meet with them, uh, calculate out the water budget tool for them, and then we would give them the Excel spreadsheet and say, now you can track your water use and keep on top of everything and everything will be good from here on out. And in a lot of cases, we would see if there's a potential for savings, there would be an uh, initial reduction. But when we looked at them a year later, their water consumption had slowly crept back up to actually where it used to be. So we do send out monthly updates. Uh, we do that for them. We update the budgets and we send it to all the interested parties, all the stakeholders, just to kind of keep it on everybody's front page. And uh, starting this year, we started color coding the graphs so they have a little bit better impact. So we like to see lots of green and yellow is a caution. And of course, we know what red means. Next slide. So the updates that we've been doing all along this way have been individual emails. And uh, this is where a majority of the time actually uh, takes place within this program uh, because there are variabilities out there. So we wanna make sure that if there is a difference in the actual water use from the calculated water needs, we look and see why there might be a reason. Uh, our meters in Gilbert are still individually uh, touch read, so we uh, manually go out and touch read each meter. It's an electronic read, but we do have to physically visit them, which means there can be different uh, days in that read period. Um, we'll also look at if there was any potential rainfall in the area where they may have gotten some usable rainfall and could have suspended the irrigation. Uh, we encourage them to do that whenever possible. And we do see it happen uh, on the uh, water consumption. When we're doing updates, when we see rainfall, these guys are actually getting pretty good at responding to it and getting out there and shutting off their controllers or installing rain sensors. Uh, this particular email was a year-end update, so we look at uh, how well they did over the course of the year. And in this particular case, uh, this community was only 1.8% off of the calculated water budget, well inside that 10% variance that we consider to be exceptional water management. And we make sure that not only if there is a, a difference in the calculated water needs to what the actual water use was, if it was actually close, we make sure to include the congratulations uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the contractors are getting recognition for their hard work out there. Uh, next slide. So the outcome is, is looking at these communities, we originally had 17 of them enrolled uh, when we began this, which accounted for 88 acres of turf and about 127 acres of planted areas. In 2007, before we initiated the program, those communities used about 250 million gallons. Uh, where in 2012, we had them down to 179.2 million gallons. Uh, so we're looking at about a 70 million gallon savings out of just 17 communities on just 88 acres of turf. So it was real successful. And you'll notice I'm pointing to 2012 there and not 2013, where you see the bar increased a little bit. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. So in 2012, uh, we had some staffing issues uh, with retirements and uh, people taking positions uh, elsewhere. Uh, it continued that trend in 2013 where it became a fire sale. Uh, for the majority of the year in 2013, I was the water conservation office for the town of Gilbert, which at that time was about 200,000 people. So if it wasn't on fire, it didn't get taken care of, unfortunately. Uh, that's where we did see the increase in water consumption by 6.6 .6 million gallons from the previous years at just those participating communities, uh, which reinforced the concept that these monthly updates are really the key to persistent savings. And that's where we as a utility are entirely focused. One time Savings is great, but when it comes to future water planning, it's persistent savings that we're really after. So fortunately, in 2014, we got back to normal staffing, and the program uh, was definitely recognized as uh, having a very good potential. So it was relaunched in March of 2014, and we set an internal goal to have 15 communities re-enrolled by July 1st. So we see what our efforts uh, resulted in on the next slide. So at that time, we actually ended up with 19 communities enrolled, so we exceeded our own internal uh, goals there. Uh, at that point, we had 72, 74 acres of turf and about 140 acres of planted areas, and the 2013 water consumption at those communities was 217 million gallons, and in 2014, those communities used 220 million gallons, which was an increase of about 1.3 million gallons. 
oops. <laughs> uh, actually, what was going on is some of those communities did not enroll until late 2014, so they still had a potential for savings. And two of the large communities in the program uh, had previously not overseeded their turf in earlier years, now began overseeding their turf. For those of you that are not familiar with the concept of overseeding here in the Southwest, especially in the Phoenix Valley, our Bermuda grass goes dormant in the wintertime. So people don't want to look at brown dormant grass during the wintertime, so they actually plant a cover crop of ryegrass, usually perennial ryegrass for the winter. Uh, so that does increase water consumption. So another community did face some uh, large scale irrigation problems with lots of uh, irrigation valve issues. So that increased the water use of that community by 3.5 million gallons alone. So we knew that in the following years as the program uh, matured, we were gonna get more accurate and predictable results, which we'll see on the next slide. So we'll see in the uh, beginning of the year before uh, we started the program in 2013. Uh, those communities that at that point, we now have uh, 54 communities enrolled. So now we've got 538 acres of turf, 466 acres of uh, planted areas. So we take them back to a baseline year before any was, anyone was in the program and we would calculate out those people need uh, just under a billion gallons worth of water, plus or minus a 20%. And they'd actually used about 1.4 billion gallons. So what we saw is when we got to year 2016, year end, uh, they had reduced their water use down to about 1.2 billion gallons. And when we look at the average annual savings of all those communities, uh, that comes to an average annual savings of about 177 million gallons per year with this program. So it's definitely a very successful program, has uh, very good uh, uh, outcomes with actual physical water savings. Next slide. So we've gotten a lot better at our marketing. Uh, some of the new staff that came on board is much better at uh, community outreach and marketing than I am. Uh, I am an irrigator, I am an engineer, so I understand the importance of this stuff. I just don't have any skill in actually making it happen. So we were very fortunate to get some people on board that are very good at this. Uh, so we did send out email invitations to all the contacts we had for all HOAs. And next slide. And of course, we put the information up on our website, and we actually uh, did some revamping of our website, so it's a lot better, and uh, got some uh, better graphs up there. Next slide. And uh, also, we do a regular blog writing, or I shouldn't say we, uh, my boss Haley does that. Uh, so they do highlight uh, this, so average residents that are saying this can uh, kind of push it from that end and get their uh, board members to start questioning why they're not in the program. Next slide. Uh, also, the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association, which we are a member of, uh, also does blogs and they've highlighted this particular program as well as some of the other programs we have in Gilbert as well. Next slide. And uh, we also do by email uh, with a listserv a uh, monthly newsletter. I believe we have uh, just over a thousand people uh, enrolled in that to receive those monthly updates. And once again, uh, these are typical residential uh, water customers. So once again, we get it to try and push it from that end to uh, work with their property managers and their board members to enroll in the program. Next, next slide. We also wanna give recognition to the communities that are successful. So we did create some signs that they could actually put out in their common area landscapes that highlight uh, their commitment to uh, taking care of our natural resources and using them wisely. Uh, Cause just driving by, you would think this is a very overwatered landscape cause it's green and it's lush. Uh, but this is actually one of the communities that uh, fell within that 20% variance criteria, which we use as the cutoff point of being uh, labeled as a Waterwise Gilbert community. Next slide. We also uh, post those websites and photos of their website or the photos of their communities up on our website, uh, recognizing them there. And ad in addition, we also invited all these community managers, board members, and landscape contractors to come to a town council meeting and be recognized by council and our mayor this last year. Next slide. So we want to make sure this program is not only effective as far as water consumption and water savings, uh, we also have to look at, of course, are we spending our money wisely? Uh, so when we look at what it takes to uh, run this program, we have to create the water budget for a community. We've got the initial email contacts, scheduling, 
finally get them to agree where everyone can have uh, show up at the same place at the same time, and then uh, begin the monthly email update process. Uh, afterwards, after communities join the program, a lot of times they will ask us to come speak at their uh, uh, HOA board meetings uh, to let their residents know that they are involved in the program and how they're doing, and also any follow-up assistance they might need. Uh, because my background is actual landscape and irrigation, um, if they're having unusual problems or trouble uh, meeting these uh, calculated water requirements and still having a healthy, attractive landscape, um, we will schedule time and I'll go out there and we'll fire up irrigation systems and start looking around and start offering suggestions on how they can improve it. Um, so we're looking at about 824 hours a year currently for these 54 communities in our program. So this is almost about a third of a full-time employee. So it's, it's a bit time consuming, but when we compare those hours and the salary and against the cost of the, uh, or the number of gallons that are saved, we'll see in the next slide just how successful it is. So our program cost uh, is about $41,000 a year. We put in some money in there for uh, vehicles and mileage and all that sort of stuff. And we compare that to the 177 million gallons of average annual savings. Uh, that comes to a cost of 23 cents per thousand gallons saved. Uh, that's far below our retail cost of water currently. And that's also far below where we're looking at our future water supplies that we may have to get. Um, right now, we do have an assured water supply in Gilbert. Uh, when we get to full build out, if we don't get our customers to decrease their water use, we're going to have to buy some additional supplies. And those additional supplies are getting to be more and more expensive. And that is a pass through cost that will uh, go to our customers. So we want to be responsible not only with the resource management, we also have to be responsible to our customers as well. So our uh, current water conservation goal is to avoid some of those higher cost uh, water supplies is we want to be able to save 4,000 acre feet a year through conservation programs. Whereas this program with the currently 177 million gallons a year of annual savings is 544 acre feet of that 4,000 gallon goal. So. That's why I've got the picture of the bird there putting up his arm saying, ta-da, great job, woohoo. <laughs> Next slide. So we are uh, integrating what I will call version 3.0 of our HOA water budget program. What's really taking a majority of the time with the program now is those uh, email monthly updates. Uh, we don't just kick them a chart and say, here you go. We actually take the time to do the analysis, uh, which is important to the success of the program. And sometimes there are actually reasons why the water use would be higher than our calculated needs, uh, should anything be going on that's a little bit different at these communities. Uh, so I met the uh, representative from Waterfluence at uh, Water Smart Innovations in 2000. 16, um, we sat down and had some uh, long talks about ET and distribution uniformity and all those fun things that irrigators talk about. And basically, this is going to allow us to have our customers instant access whenever they want through an online portal. So community managers that manage multiple sites can uh, log on to one place at this portal and see the information for all of their communities. It also allows them to see historical water use, so they can look at uh, long-term trends, whereas currently what they're just being sent is a one-year analysis. So if they want to know what happened in previous years, they have to contact me. I have to generate those water budgets and send it back out to them. This allows it to happen all at once. So what this allows me to do is to do one data upload a month instead of 54 emails. So this is going to be some very good things for us and our customers that we'll see on our next uh, slide here. So this is definitely going to further uh, reduce the cost of the program uh, based on the uh, employee time that's spent with all those uh, monthly email updates. Uh, that's going to allow time for recruiting more new communities into the program. Uh, it's also going to allow for more timely updates. Unfortunately, you know, <laughs> in the real world, things come up, and today's my day to send out these 12 or 15 updates. Uh, but if something's on fire, I may have to put that on hold for a few days, and they may not get their... Uh, a monthly update right on the date they're expecting it. Now with this one-time shot of uh, one data upload to this portal, that takes that uh, condition right out of the uh, potential scenarios. This also allows more time for on-site assistance for going out and helping these communities improve their irrigation systems. And that's one of the things we want to work with is these contractors. We want to make sure that we're working with the contractors and helping them communicate to their customers 
that they really need to start taking care of these irrigation systems and increasing their efficiency. That way it allows them to use less water, have a better looking landscape. And in many cases, these landscapers, when I've been talking to them, they've been suggesting these upgrades and these uh, improvements to these irrigation systems to their customers. Uh, but now what's happening is an outside entity that is not trying to take over their contract is agreeing with the contractor and saying, look, you really need to do this. And based on your excess water use that is being used to cover up an inefficient irrigation system, you can start looking at some return on investment numbers. So it's good for the contractor. It's good for the landscape uh, uh, itself. It's good for the uh, homeowners that actually pay those water bills. And of course, it's great for us as a utility. One other great thing that's happening here is this is now using real-time ET instead of historical ET. So instead of trying to say, well, it looks like your water use is 30% higher this month than it should have been, but or it was a really hot month. Uh, this June in Phoenix was particularly hot. We had a few days where we had to shut down the airport because it was too hot for airplanes to take off. So <laughs> if it's hotter, the landscapes need more water. So now that's actually going to be automatically reflected in there. And it's also real-time ET for the days within the meter read period. So that takes that other issue out of the equation where we have to do all this uh, uh, additional analysis and uh, explanation of why it, the water use might be different than what we calculated is needed. So I think our last slide here is just uh, asking you if there's any questions. And I haven't been paying attention to my timer, so I don't know how close I am to my 30-minute time slot. How'd I do, guys? Hi, Jeff. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, we're right at three o'clock now. Um, so we know we understand it's usually from two to three, but we'll add in a few extra minutes so that we can uh, let some people type in their questions as well as uh, have a bit of a Q&A. Um, so as everyone's taking their time to type in their questions to the chat box, we'd like to put up a few poll questions. After we take questions from today's speakers, We'll have a few more slides to close out the session and ask one more poll question about topics for future webinars. So for the first question, as you're typing your questions into the chat box, we'll get to those in a minute. Um, what type of landscapes do you work with? Residential only, commercial only, or both residential and commercial? Great, so it looks like almost everyone on the call works with both residential and commercial landscapes. Thanks for filling that out for us. And then we wanted to offer, uh, if anyone needs a way to note their attendance of their webinar, please answer this poll question indicating that you do need a way to note your attendance. And we can send an email confirming your attendance. Great, thanks. We'll take that into account and send emails as needed. So I think we'd like to go ahead and ask some questions now. Um, the first question, Marianne, is for you. When you were talking about the city that provided 10 flags, were you talking about sprinkler flags in that instance? Uh, yes. And that was for Tampa, is that correct? That's what I'm remembering, yes. And if there's specific questions about it, if you go to the matrix, which we've posted online, there will likely be a footnote in that area around Tampa, and you can see uh, the details for the Tampa program. Great, thank you. And we have another question for you, Marianne, about communities that have adopted permanent watering restrictions that limit irrigation to a maximum of two days per week. How much water are those communities saving? Do you know? 
Well, the communities are all going to be different. Uh, Sacramento just recently was one of the cities who just adopted a permanent two-day watering schedule. And so the amount of water that they will save will, because of their climate conditions, will be likely much higher than a community that might be in the southeast. So every, every community that adopts the permanent uh, restrictions does so with an analysis of how it benefits their overall water budgets in their city and what it might save the average consumer in terms of uh, reduced irrigation demand. So there isn't a general answer to that. It's very specific to the region and the community. Wonderful. Thanks for that information. And then, Jeff, a question for you. The on-site inspections where you run through all the zones, how do you inspect the drip irrigation systems? And I'm sorry, I think I misread the first part of that. Do you run through all the zones? Well, typically, depending on the site, we just don't have enough staff time to turn on every single irrigation station. Uh, but if we turn on a certain percentage of them, we're going to get a pretty good idea as far as what the overall condition of the system is. Um, and often when we're doing that, we're actually getting a request uh, from the landscape contractor or the uh, uh, water customer to go do that. And we do coordinate that with the landscape contractor. And these guys predominantly know where their problem areas are. So they're going to direct me to some of the worst areas that they do have out there. Uh, we're not doing catch can audits or anything like that. We will turn on the system and look for the common problems, low heads, tipped heads. Uh, we can see bad head spacing. We can see uh, we will take some pressure readings. Uh, as far as the drip irrigation goes, it is much more difficult to get a visual inspection on. Uh, but we can spot some of the problems early on. Uh, one of the things we'll do is we'll actually take a uh, flow rate reading at the meter. And if we know there's X number of plants on that uh, line and they're using predominantly X gallon per hour emitters on there, we can say, okay, this zone should be using about 12.2 gallons per minute or whatever it may be. Uh, when we turn on that zone and we find out it's using 25 to 30 gallons per minute, we can definitely uh, uh, identify that there is some issue there and start taking closer looks at individual zones. Great. And another question for you, Jeff. Are there any irrigation programs you know of that put money into training the contractor in water efficiency and also provide rebates to the actual company for installing weather-based or central controllers? Um, well, it's pretty much a utility by a utility thing as to whether or not they're offering rebates for smart irrigation technologies, uh, whether it's smart controllers, uh, pressure regulating heads, uh, pressure compensating emitters, uh, soil moisture sensing, uh, control systems, all that sort of stuff. Uh, currently, Gilbert is uh, uh, running a pilot program uh, for our non-residential customers uh, for some smart irrigation uh, technologies. Basically, what we're trying to do is gather some data and see what a, a good potential for savings may be. And again, start looking back at those calculations and seeing how many dollars per thousand gallons it costs to achieve those savings to see if it's going to be a worthwhile program for us. Now, as far as training goes, uh, we are involved uh, through the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association and uh, uh, the City of Tucson and uh, the University of Arizona in our SmartScape program uh, here in Arizona that is specifically for uh, contractor training. Uh, because it is subsidized a lot by the water conservation offices, it is an extremely affordable training session. So it's uh, eight classes of three hours a, p a piece, and we cover more than just irrigation topics. We talk about soils, we talk about plants, we talk about uh, pests and diseases, and of course some irrigation topics. And we did want to increase the amount of irrigation training we had, uh, so we did create an add-on module called Advanced Smartscape, which is three five-hour classes specifically on irrigation and of course we support our other uh, local trainings that are available whether it's through the Arizona Landscape Contractors Association or our uh, Desert Botanical Garden also has a uh, excellent training resource. Thanks Jeff and I know we're running short on time so we just have time for one more question. Uh, if we didn't have a chance to get to your question we'll go ahead and send those along to the appropriate speaker and we'll email you the answers. So for our last question today, how did you determine the water requirement for each type of plant in the landscapes you were looking at, Jeff? 
Uh, well, our plan palettes that are used in HOA communities are uh, generally pretty homogenous. Uh, we have a lot of very common plants out there. Now, we do have some communities that do have uh, a lot more variation out there. Uh, but really what we're doing is we're just applying a simple crop coefficient to the uh, planted areas. And in most cases, we will give them about a 30% crop coefficient uh, off of reference ET. Uh, now there's been some specific communities we've worked with, uh, some apartment communities uh, that either have a very dense landscape, so we can change that parameter. Uh, but if we look at some of the older communities that still have uh, higher water use plant materials out there, uh, we will individually adjust those crop coefficients for those communities. And Amanda, if anyone has any questions for uh, the Alliance for Water Efficiency, they can email me at Marianne, M-A-R-Y-A-N-N, -N, at A, the number four, W-E dot O-R-G. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for your presentations. And we just have a few more slides um, and one final poll question, if everyone can hang in just a few more minutes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Now, some of you may already be WaterSense partners, but we might be new to a few of you others. Our program depends on our partners to carry the message of water efficiency to consumers. These are the categories of partners that we have. Many of the utility and government organizations on the call today fall into our promotional partner category. I want to encourage you to become a WaterSense partner. After all, it's free and we have a lot of material to help you communicate water efficiency. And finally, our last poll question. Hopefully you're finding these webinars to be beneficial. We'd like your input on potential topics for future webinars. So what webinar topics are you interested in for the future? All right, it looks like we're pretty split on improvements and water saving features of turf grass as well as consumer focused irrigation auditing and then a lot of uh, cloud based solutions to irrigation as well. So we'll take all of that into account and if you're interested in a webinar topic that's not listed here, please feel free to type that topic into the chat box. I'd like to thank Jeff and Mary Ann, our two speakers today, and thank you all for participating. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It was fun. You're welcome.